On the third night's performance, there was a cough, muffled, sporadic, persistent. Magnus tried to ignore it as he lured the audience through John Nicholson's serial misadventures, from the desperate mugging on Colton Hill to his creeping home to face the paternal music, through the father's chilly disappointment to the son's shame-filled escape. How John reached California, how he was rooked and robbed and beaten and starved, how he was at last taken up by charitable folk, and so fell for a time into a high degree of good fortune, which was only a longer way about to fresh disaster. On the fourth night, there was a repetitive sigh. The culprit waited for moments of tension and then exhaled as if expressing a long-held disappointment. On the fifth night, as Magnus spoke John's heartfelt plea, Father, I have come back to ask your forgiveness. His well-crafted pause was punctured by a slow, weary laugh. Heads swivelled in the audience, shoulders shrugged. Nobody apologised. Well, these things happened, apparently, in small venues. Magnus soothed his pride with four pints at the assembly bar and flirted with a Spanish girl who recognised him from a film. He left her place at 3 a.m., free of both hangover and guilt. At 10 next morning, he was interviewed on Calton Hill for a TV arts programme. The angle was predictable. Stevenson, the city's most famous teller of tales, interpreted by a successful Scottish actor. Just what was fresh and different about his show? Me, he thought. Me, here, doing it, woman. It's not one of his best-known stories, Kirsten, but it's so much about the city which he knew so well, the various strata of society, the hypocrisies, the history in every cobblestone. He's here, you see. RLS is here. That night... The noises increased. A whispering from where the stage exit door was covered by heavy black drapes. It hissed and echoed under and after random words and sentences. The technicians swore backstage had been cleared of staff, that no audience had wondered, there were no speakers positioned, no mics live, no logical cause for what Magnus had heard. Sunday no performance. He ate and slept and felt irritably on edge. Late on Monday afternoon, he set off from his digs, close by the botanics, arriving at the theatre with his usual fifty minutes to spare. The Scottish Storytelling Centre would always be to him the Netherbow Theatre. He'd watched his elders there, in its sunken auditorium, when he was still a drama student parodied their accents, taken mental notes on their stagecraft. He had memories now of watching some particularly heroic solo effort in the late seventies, but the name, the play, gone, erased by time. Its former gloomy atmosphere had been banished by light and paint. The smart new cafe was thronged with tourists, and noisy children pressed random buttons at the Stevenson interactive wall. A group listened to a section from Kidnapped, damp mouths agape at young Davy's innocence and Uncle Ebenezer's lies. Hold on. An actor's voice here, immediately above the theatre, might it somehow be seeping down into his domain? Bustling a child aside with his knee, he knelt and put his ear to the speakers. Seasoned male narrator, mouth close to the mic. Gotcha. He collared the technician, got him to pull the plug on the equipment, then went down to stand for a few moments in the empty auditorium. Nothing but his own controlled breathing. For the first half that night, relief brought new energy. He was at ease with the narrative, until the moment when John Nicholson finds a body in the Murrayfield house, when... 
The images began to come clearer and stay longer in his fancy, and next the power of thought came back to him, and the horror and danger of his situation rooted him to the ground. The danger of his situation rooted him to the ground. The voice was still a whisper, but the mechanics were audible, lips and tongue and palate. Slowly, he turned his head to the right, stared into the black nothingness. He wanted to run across the stage and rip back the curtains to expose the trickster who must be there. But he could not move. His feet were rooted. He'd never felt helpless on stage like this, never truly been scared before of losing his way, of losing his speech, having no control over what happened next. His fears, once wakened, grew with every hour. No, wait, no, that was a line from further on in the story. The voice anticipated him. He was being pushed to skip forward, improvise. Pushed? Impossible. A devil of dumbness had him by the throat. The devil of terror babbled in his ears. The voice had leapt forward again, not only pushing him, but instructing him of his feelings. The blue-white light burned his eyes. Sweat beaded on his brow, dripped to the dusty floor by his feet. Understanding was beyond him, but in any case, Magnus Lovett didn't believe in this kind of thing. Miserably conscious of time stretching, of the audience's silent eyes upon him, he still could not articulate what was happening. His chest hurt, a reminder to draw breath. It rushed into his lungs with a strange shivering drone. And again, he found a line and went on with all the technique he could muster, but none of the spirit. As he bowed, accepting the perfunctory applause, his clothes were drenched, and his hands trembled. Magnus left the building by a side door, and walked, 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 and at last he listened. He listened to himself, thinking the unthinkable. By performing a play, in acting a story, was he, could he be, bringing into being things that did not exist? Was it possible? His senses were pricked, as if every hair on his body were an antenna, hearing, feeling, knowing, imagining, projecting, enlarging on realities, familiar terms, familiar concepts, but he had never before analysed his assumptions about atheism and belief. Would he be able to go on? Could he stand on that stage again, endure that voice again? At what risk? This would not do. There was a taxi rank at the West End. He returned to the flat, drank a large whisky, and put himself to bed. Waiting for sleep, his mind roamed. The imagination was a funny thing, an unfunny thing, unchancy, unfettered. He lay with eyes shut, trying to list the many triumphs of his career, but his thoughts kept veering towards the failures, the tiny flaws, the moments of misjudgment, of pettiness, jealousy, spite, arrogance. Why had he fallen into this trap of middle age, the actor's vanity project, capering for fools in a little box like a circus flea? To get attention to be known and admired. Magnus got up and gazed at the dull shimmer of slate rooftops stretching from the new town towards Leith. He remembered the Macker's Court, the plaque on which was written, 
there are no stars as lovely as Edinburgh street lamps. Stevenson's thought, the sentiment of an exile, of a lost son. With a great wash of astonishment, Magnus recognised the undercurrents in his own Edinburgh childhood, his father's disappointments, the liberation of escape. He put out a hand to his reflection in the window pane. An old actor's face came back to him. The name? Ronald Boyd. A figure from the glory days of Scottish rep whose solo play at the Netherbow Magnus had seen repeatedly. To study him, to learn how things were done, to steal the man's talent. Those inflections, gestures, the way he held an audience with his voice and his eyes, he, Magnus, had carefully folded them into his repertoire and trotted them out to acclaim ever since. Ronald Boyd, a rich, rounded tone to his delivery, fluent with the old Scots. He must be gone by now. Magnus was early to the netherbow that evening. In the corridor to the dressing room, a door was ajar, and through it he glimpsed the expanse of ancient stone wall which marked where this building met its neighbour. The acoustic indicated a cramped, low-ceilinged space, and he wanted to go on, but it was cave-like, too dark to explore in safety. Edging back towards the door, his shoulder hit something tall which toppled into him, and he slipped and fell hard onto the stone flags, his cry of shock and pain cut off as he lost consciousness. He was aware again. He knew that he was on stage in total blackout, but he could sense that nobody was there. He shouted, Where are you? but the effort produced no sound in that dead space. Are you not ashamed to show yourself? It was Flora, John Nicholson's sweetheart, who said it in the story, and yet it was neither her voice nor his. With the voice came a scent, something damp and smoky like a duffel coat soaked in the rain and infused with the ash of a million cigarettes. In the darkness, Magnus rubbed his eyes, and they were wet. Forgive me, he thought, and gathered breath to expel the words as loud as he was able. Forgive me. He bowed his head, as he'd done every night, at the end of every performance. But this time, it was not a trick to make the audience love him.